up this check up this man meat right here. Oh, no, not the oh, man man meat. meat. Ooh, welcome back to another stra 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 strange and mysterious podcast. Of course, I'm one of your hosts, G. Introduce yourself, fellas. The G. Matthew Royball, Define Triple Nine, aka the Rat. The Rat. Ratoncito. And, and your boy McVice. Yes, I'm back. And I am officially Facebook official. So sorry, ladies. <laughs> he is off the market. Sorry, ladies. He's 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 left left it I've been off the market since February, but I guess it didn't count, so I put it on Facebook. No, once it's on Facebook, it's a big flashing sign to the world. Right. I am off the market. Well, hey, uh, to most I don't people. know. Can, can yeah. you guys hear that? All the lady tears that just happened right now? <laughs> <laughs> Is it raining outside? I think it so. Might be. <laughs> might be. <laughs> a lot of broken hearts tonight. Lots of broken hearts. Sorry. Sorry, ladies. Um, so tonight we have um, a really cool, interesting um, account. Uh, this talks about Operation Serpo. McVice, have you ever heard of Operation Serpo? I don't think I have. No, Operation uh, Dark Knight or Crystal Knight, I think it is. Crystal Knight. That one rings more of a bell. That one's more of a bell. Uh, how about you, Mr. Mateo Ratoncito? Ratoncito que... No sé. I, I I have not heard of either of those. I mean, I think I have heard of certain elements, sort of like you, Gabe, you were saying you've heard pieces mm -hmm. here and there uh, of it. But the official names, that kind of stuff, no. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I, I've heard bits and pieces of it. And um, it's kind of interesting how it kind of connects. And so... This channel we're about to watch is called the, the WF channel, right? The what if, right? Or what the channel, right? And so it talks about this Operation Serpo. So it's really interesting. We're probably going to have to do it in two parts because it's long, but it's a very interesting video. So let's check it out. Is there violence, Gabe? Is there uh, violence, violence against bit. people? <laughs> I don't see it per se, but there is some things. All right, y'all ready? I'm ready. Mm -hmm. All right, let's do it. What if you were offered the opportunity to visit another planet? You'd get to experience the culture of an alien race, explore Shut a new up. world, see and use technology that's 5,000 hey, years ahead of ours. That's some bullshit. Would you do it? Well, before you answer, there are a few catches. You'll be gone at least 10 years. And when you return to Earth, all evidence of your existence will be erased. You have to start a new life with a new identity forbidden to tell anyone about what you experienced. Now, would you do it? Well, 1965, 12 astronauts were sent to an alien planet as part of a human alien exchange program. 13 years later, they returned home. Well, most of them did. The mission commander wrote a 3,000 page report of everything the team experienced. First alien contact, the 40 light year trip to the alien world, and everything that happened on the planet. This is the true story of Project Serpa. I like the music. Project, project. When Colonel yeah, of the United good. States Air Force arrived at Fort Leavenworth, he was excited, but he didn't have much information. All he knew is that he was selected from hundreds of candidates to command the most important space mission in the history of the human race. That's quite a description. Naturally, he asked for details about the mission, but was Darn told me. he would be briefed during training. McKeever did know the mission was going to be long, 10 years, plus almost oh, a year for training long. and another year in quarantine no. at the end of the mission. So 12 years. What's up? No, I said Stargate SG-1. Oh, yeah, like the old yeah. school. That was a good series. <laughs> yeah, it's very Stargate. Yep. Yeah, very Stargate, right? <laughs> totally. It was away from home. It was 1965, so he wouldn't be back until the late 70s. Now, for most people, this would be difficult. But McKeever had no relatives, no wife, no kids, and very few Who's friends. Lonely? His life was the Air Force. As far as he was concerned, he could leave for 12 years or 20. It was all the same to him. And that was a good thing because another condition of the mission is that he was to be sheep dipped. Sheep dipped? Well, sheep dipped is an intelligence term used to describe identities like that are made shit. to disappear. All records, military, civilian, school records, social security, DMV, IRS, it's like you never existed. No, I wouldn't oh, mind sure. disappearing from the IRS. I understand that. Tax is a theft. Colonel McKeever parked his car. That fish is kind of tripping me out. 
he's real <laughs> interested strange. in everything hey, maybe, that's going on. Maybe he's the alien. Uh, I think that's a uh, possible hypothesis. Hey, something's fishy over here. But <laughs> <laughs> and was met by a young military police officer. After exchanging salutes, they walked in silence to an office building at the edge of the base. The outside of the building was nondescript, painted that gray-green beige color that the military used Old for everything. Footage. The inside of the building was very different, though. As a colonel, McKeever had been in plenty of secure buildings, but nothing like this. Metal detectors, cameras everywhere, armed guards posted in every hallway. McKeever's escort motioned to an elevator. McKeever asked, you're not coming with me? The young man said no, he didn't have clearance. He saluted and the elevator doors closed. McKeever felt the elevator taking him several stories down. He noticed there were no buttons in the elevator, no indication of the number of floors. The elevator doors opened and another young man was waiting. McKeever noticed his badge said Air Force Office of Special Investigations. As far as Colonel McKeever that knew, was. OSI was a law enforcement agency. He had no idea what they would be doing here, but he knew not to ask. McKeever entered the briefing room, which looked like a classroom. There were 11 people seated. He saw two Army uniforms, two Navy, and the rest were Air Force. At the front of the room was another Air Force colonel that McKeever didn't recognize, who told him to take a seat. The other colonel said to the group, What I'm about to show you is classified beyond top secret. There are fewer than 60 people in the world who know this information. If you repeat what you learn here today, you'll be charged with treason. Buttons. Understood? The group nodded slowly, clearly aware of the weight of the situation. The colonel pulled down a screen and called to someone to get the... What if you were a social butterfly and they told you that? And you're like, okay. <laughs> and then you start drinking a little bit, start hanging with the fella. <laughs> Be yeah. like, hey, hey, I, got, like, I got a story hey, to tell. Yeah, uh, yeah especially only, if it's only, as juicy as a fucking alien. <laughs> be like, only 61 people, soon to be 62 people are going to know this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey, at the local pub. Yeah. <laughs> right. The oh, government fucked up if they did that. <laughs> hey, bartender, another round. Let's get it. That's probably why some of us wouldn't be chosen for this. Movie. No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that they. The psychologists sure would be like they this. Fil they filter out social butterflies. Yeah. Trust me. Oh yeah. In that process. Lights on the screen, a black and white film began to play. The first few seconds were the typical warnings about unauthorized viewing and other disclaimers that Colonel McKeever had seen a thousand times. The footage showed what appeared to be the desert at night, though it was hard to tell. The footage seemed to be 20 years old. Then a title came on the screen that McKeever didn't expect. It read, Roswell, New Mexico, 1947, First Contact. <gasps> Interesting. The film lasted about an hour and left everyone in the room stunned. They had heard of Roswell and the supposed UFO crash. The Air Force said it was a weather balloon and that explanation was good enough for McKeever. The film explained that the UFO crash in Roswell did happen, though technically the crash was in Corona, New Mexico. And two years later, in 1949, another UFO crashed nearby. Now, this was something McKeever didn't know. And there was footage of the Roswell recovery. At first, it was difficult to understand what he was looking at. It was clearly metal wreckage, but it could have been a plane for all McKeever knew. Then he saw it. Hiding behind a rock was an alien. It looked like aliens look in science fiction movies. Short. Wait a second. Is that Juan? Oh, shit. Oh, he's hurt. Hey, someone's oh, his arms up. Yeah. Look, he's giving us the middle fingers like, like fuck you, fool. humans. <laughs> Pale skin, large head with huge black eyes, small nose and mouth. The military called this creature Extraterrestrial Biological Entity 1, or EVA-1. EVA-1 was the lone survivor of the crash. Five other alien bodies were taken away. There was also footage of the 1949 crash. It was a similar craft, silver, saucer-shaped, and there were six bodies there and no survivors. Eba one was taken to the Air Force facility at Los Alamos, and according to the briefing, he stayed there until his death in 1952. The Air Force learned a great deal from Eba one in those five years. At first, communication was difficult. Eba one's language was comprised of tones, not words, but through hand gestures. Hey, he was like this, hand gestures. Yep. Yeah. Hey, this is very difficult. <laughs> and repetition, Eba One was able to communicate. He said that his race, which the military called the Ebens, had been visiting Earth for 2,000 years. On this trip, 
something caused his ship to crash. Evil One suspected it was radar, which was a technology his people didn't have. Some equipment was salvaged from Evil One's craft, specifically a communication device. Evil One offered to share this technology if the military would allow him to repair it so he could contact his people. Of course, the military agreed. Evil One was able to get the communicator working again and sent several messages but never received a reply. And this could have been due to a number of reasons. Evil One's home planet, which the military called Serpo, was in the Zeta Reticuli system, almost 40 light years from Earth. The Ebens used wormhole technology to travel and send messages back and forth. After Evil One died in 1952, the Air Force tried but was unable to reverse engineer other alien technology. But they did have a working communicator. So the Air Force continued to send messages for years. The persistence paid off. Eventually, they received a reply and two-way communication between Earth and Serpo continued for a long time. The Evens even learned to speak broken English. After learning about the crashes, the Evens wanted their crew's bodies back, but the military- Hey, they, was thinking, they, were, they were talking Ebonics. Mm -hmm. Hey, you close the door? You gonna close the door? <laughs> hey, can I get full? <laughs> Man, their English are broken. <laughs> what, is this, what is this foreign language? <laughs> I, I can barely understand them, Bob. God, what is this? Travis Alien language. talk. Alien talk. <laughs> <laughs> Terry, being the military, wanted something in exchange. Now, let me guess. They wanted technology. Yep. But the Ebens said it would be too dangerous to give humans their technology. Well, I could have told them that. So the Ebens suggested a compromise. The military would return the bodies of the alien crew. In exchange, an Eben would come to Earth and assist the U.S. Army. And 12 humans could spend 10 years on planet Serpo. This became known as Project Serpo though its actual name is Project Crystal Knight. And so began the first intergalactic exchange program in history. The training was intense and long, a year. Nah. Colonel McKeever thought special forces had a difficult training program, but it was nothing like this. There were the usual physical exercises and classroom training. They trained in survival, escape and evasion techniques, weapons, explosives, and intelligence gathering. They also learned about even history and even biology. But there was aggressive and invasive psychological training and testing. McKeever remembered one unusually difficult exercise designed to test the team's ability to cope with isolation and confined spaces. Team members were buried seven feet underground, one at a time, Damn. in a seven by five foot box for five days. No lights, no way to communicate. Only a small air hole and food and water. Everybody passed the- hey, I wonder if one of the uh, tests were so what if an Eben takes your cracker? What are you going to do? <laughs> I can't take this shit anymore. I'm off He's my mind, motherfucker. Right? You touch my cracker, we going to have some problems, aliens. Yeah, how does how do Chingasos work with aliens? <laughs> right? Hey, they're like, nah, he dead. This test but some people really struggled with it. Oh, come on. Five by seven feet is a palace. Grow up here. During training, McKeever got to know his team. There were scientists, linguists, pilots, two doctors, and a security officer. They all received general training and training geared toward their specialty. For example, the pilots were taught how to fly an even aircraft. This was surprisingly easy and apparently a lot of fun. The Evens returned to Earth in 1964 to retrieve the bodies. This happened at Holloman Air Force Base in New Mexico. And there's actually footage of that landing. Hey, that spacecraft's going uh, pretty uh, crooked over there. Someone's hung over. Someone's had a little too much to drink. Hey, someone was in Vegas. <laughs> they are at the crap stable. About a year later, in July 1965, the team traveled to Groom Lake near Area 51 for the landing. At 6 a.m., the Eben ship landed. Several Evens came out to meet the team of 12 and about 16 military officials. The human team was allowed to bring whatever they needed for the stay. They brought 40 tons of gear, including 10 motorcycles and three Jeeps. Everything was easily loaded using anti-gravity technology. Now, lucky for us, McKeever was ordered to keep diary. Okay, we loaded everything and it fits, but we have to transfer all of it to the bigger ship once we get to the rendezvous point. 
really excited about this. No reservations by anyone. The training commander asked all members to make a final decision. The team all said go. We go. Interior of Eba Craft is big. There are three levels. This is different than the one we trained on. I think that was a scout craft. This one is a shuttle craft. The shuttle flew into a large ship. McKeever wrote that the shuttle bay ceiling was about 100 feet high. It would take almost 10 months to get to Serpo. The human team was escorted to the area where they would be spending the next 270 days. Each team member was assigned a small pod, each with a single chair, no seat belts or harnesses. McKeever was surprised that gravity was consistent. He was expecting to be weightless. Then he saw a light panel change from white to red. He assumed this meant they were moving. His eyes became blurry, the room started to spin, and then he blacked out. The journey was difficult. The human team spent a large part of 10 months sick. They would often become dizzy and sometimes physically ill. During one part of the journey, and even gave the humans a cloudy liquid that tasted like chalk and a cookie or a biscuit. Hey, he's like, what is this, bro? I feel funny. <laughs> hey, they're getting them all screwed up. Yeah, the, the one alien went, wait, 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 don't take that. <laughs> already took it. Oh, what did I take? The alien, the Eben, it's like, you just took the most acid, alien acid I've ever seen anyone take. <laughs> this human is down. Hell yeah. 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 See, even the Ebens were, were, were doing it big. That had no taste at all. But when they ate it, they felt better almost instantly. After a while, the human team was allowed to move around the ship. We were able to walk around the ship, but it's so large, it's difficult to understand how such a large ship can move so fast. 633 wants to see the engines. Our guide takes four of us to the engine room, or whatever they wish to call the room. It contains large, very large metal containers. They are in a circle, with the ends of each pointing into the center. Many pipes or some type of large tubes connects them. In the center of these containers is a copper-colored coil, or something looking like a coil. There's a bright light being shined from a point above into the center of the coil. We hear a very dull hum, but no major loud sounds. 661 thinks it is a negative matter versus positive matter system. One day, toward the end of the journey, McKeever got out of his pod and asked the assistant commander, team member 203, to round up the team. 203? Yep. Team members were now required to refer to each other by their number and not their name. Oh, because they were dipped in the, uh, the sheep thing? Sheep dipped. So 203 rounds up the team, but there's a problem. One of the pilots, team member 308, is missing. McKeever asks what happened to 308. One of the even says, Earthman not alive. Uh-oh. McKeever asked to see hey, him. Overdose. <laughs> yeah. It hit him. But the even say that's not possible. The security officer, team member 899, says, I'm going to get the guns. Part of the gear the human team brought included weapons. They were each issued a rifle. They hey, I love the fact that the first problem they have, go get the strap. We immediately go to guns. <laughs> go get the strap. Yeah, I don't know if that's the, the first choice. <laughs> hey, just start an intergalactic war. Yeah, it's cool. Yeah, I, hey, we, we have to had get our guns. They also had grenades and C4 explosives. The 899 begins to storm off when a female Eben, who speaks very good English, says, please, no guns. She explains that 308's body is in quarantine until they can figure out what happened. The Ebens allow the human doctors, 700 and 754, to examine the body. They determine 308 died from an embolism, but the Ebens want him to remain quarantined. McKeever agrees as long as 308 can be given a proper burial on Serpo. Not long after that, the humans are instructed to return to their pods and prepare for landing, which they do. There must be something about jumping in and out of a wormhole that's hard on human anatomy because McKeever blacks out again. Boy, this guy really can't hold his wormhole. Six hours later, his pod opens and his team walks to the door. Slowly, the door opens. The door opens and bright light washes into the craft. The team members were issued heavy duty sunglasses like those worn during nuclear bomb tests. They quickly put them on. The first thing McKeever noticed was the heat. He asked one of the scientists, team member 633, to check the temperature. 107 degrees Fahrenheit. The landscape is like barren. Rock, there are hills in the distance, but no vegetation. Just soil and rock and blue sky above. McKeever thinks it looks like Arizona or New Mexico. One major difference, yeah. two suns in the sky. 
McKeever's report supposedly has several thousand photographs and even film. Unfortunately, these haven't been leaked, except for one photo, the two sons of Serpo. Serpo is in the Zeta Reticuli binary star system. Because of its two suns, Serpo is never in complete darkness. According to the report, Serpo has one main sun that the planet orbits, the second sun is farther away. A large number of Ebens have gathered for the arrival. They're all a little over four feet tall, and the human team can't really tell them apart unless they're wearing different clothing. A female- Wait a second, that's a little bit racist to the aliens? You can't tell them apart? Come on. Hey, Think what do the humans better. do? They go they to different alike. They all look yeah. alike. <laughs> they immediately they immediately <laughs> racialize it, huh? Hey, you racist bastards. Eben, who they designate Eba 2, introduces herself as translator and guide. The human team is escorted through an Eben village to where they'll be staying. And for a technologically advanced species, the way the Ebens live appears somewhat primitive. There are only about 650,000 Ebens on the planet who live in small communities. At the center of each community is a large tower about 300 feet high. On top of the tower is what looks like a mirror. The humans learn that this tower is how Ebens tell time. This was a difficult adjustment because the even day is 40 hours long, not 24. Damn. And with there never being darkness, it was hard. Can you imagine working that day? No, fuck 40 that. hours in a day? <laughs> Holy shit. Yeah, that's that's basically like half. That's yeah, that's that's tough. That's a whole hey, work the, week. Hey, the pay would have been nice, though, but you'd be dead by the time you get to Wednesday. Yeah, we're, that would hey. be a tough thing to adjust to. What happened to 705? Oh, he's dead tired. He's dead tired. Yeah, I knew, I knew that. To knew adapt their schedules. Please Even families were similar to Earth's, typically a female and a male with two children. Families were only allowed to have two children, and children were rarely seen. They mature very quickly and are isolated while they're young. The even homes were small domes that reminded the team of adobe houses in the Southwest. The humans finally arrive at their accommodations. Eba 2 leads us to a series of huts, looking like adobe-style houses. There are four. Behind them is an underground room or storage area. It is built into the ground, underground. We have to walk down a ramp. The doors look like military igloos that store our atomic bombs and Earth. All our gear taken off the spaceship is stored there. We walked down into this area, very large room. Very cool, a lot cooler. We might have to sleep here. All our gear is there. 16 pallets of gear. This igloo is made up of something like concrete, but not the same texture. Feels like soft rubber, but still hard. The floor is made up of the same stuff. There are lights in the ceiling. Looks like spotlights. They have electricity. Each home was equipped with an electrical device that looks like a small piece of plexiglass. No matter what's connected to it, the device outputs the correct amount of voltage. These devices could power a small handheld radio or an entire home without a problem. Supposedly, one of these devices was recovered from Roswell, but scientists haven't been able to reverse engineer this technology. Allegedly. Right. Now that they're finally on the yeah. planet, McKeever requests the body the of the 308 so they can give him a prop. What's up? I love how the fish has his little tin tin hat. His right? Little, uh, tin foil hat. Hey, he's a conspiracy theorist. He's a true conspiracy theorist. <laughs> Aliens. Proper burial. Eba 1 takes McKeever to a building that looks like a medical facility. An even doctor meets them at the door. He speaks English almost perfectly. McKeever says he wants 308's body. The even doctor is confused. He says you can't have him. McKeever says, give us our man or we'll take him by force. Eba 2 jumps in. She says it's not that they don't want to return 308's body, it's that they can't. The doctor confirms this and says we're using him. McKeever asks what he means. The doctor casually says, well, we're cloning him and using him to create hybrids. What the? Obviously, cloning a member of the team without permission was a problem. But McKeever heard the doctor out. When even it was considered a great honor to donate your body to science for experimentation and cloning. McKeever doubted he could do much about the situation. The Evens were peaceful, but they did have a military. If they wanted to put the humans in prison, or worse, McKeever knew there wasn't much he could do about it. We were only yeah. 11 military personnel. We had no way of fighting the Evens. We did not come 40 light years to start a war with the Evens. Right. A war we could not win. We could not even hey, win a simple fist easy. fight with Evens. Even if we could, what then? So with the help of Eba 2, the doctor agrees that 308's body will not be used anymore. 
not that it mattered much. The doctor said all of 308's blood, organs, tissue, and everything was used to create new creatures. McKeever said, show me. In a small anti-gravity aircraft, the human team was flown to a laboratory facility. The inside of the building was completely white. There were a lot of Evens walking around. And the new creatures were named Michelangelo, Raphael. <laughs> Teenage Ninja Turtles. All wearing blue clothing. <laughs> when they were brought to the I first lab. Funny. Now this funny. <laughs> there were rolls of containers looking like. I do a good master splinter. FYI. Glass bathtubs. Inside each bathtub were bodies. I was shocked. As were 7754. Bodies. Strange looking bodies. Not human bodies. At least not all of them. We started walking down the space between the tubs. We looked into the tubs. These were hideous looking creatures. The first creature I see inside the tub looks like a porcupine. It appears to have a tube placed inside of it. The tube leads to a box underneath the tub. The next creature looks like nothing I can compare it to. It has blood red skin, two spots in the middle, maybe eyes, no arms or legs. It had a very strange odor. The next creature That's was human, -like, but the skin was white, not skin white, the color white. The skin was wrinkled. The head was large with two eyes, two ears and a mouth. The neck was very small. The head looked almost as if it sat on the lower torso. The chest was thin with large bone-like protrusions. The arms were curled with hands, but no thumbs. The legs were also curled with feet, but only three toes. I couldn't look at any more creatures. Next, they went to what the doctor called a growing room. Here they used parts of different species, including parts of the dead human, to create new species. Eba Chu said that parts of the blood and other organs are used to mix a substance that's placed inside the bodies. That was all Eba Chu could explain in English. They were breathing. They look like humans, most of them. Two of the beings on the end look like humans with dog heads. These beings were not awake. What? They were either sleeping or drugged. They finally arrived at a growing chamber that contained an entity that was created using parts of 308's body. I was shocked. This being, with our teammates' blood and cells, looked like a large even, but the hands and legs were similar to humans. How could they have grown this being so quick? Obviously, this is well above our intelligence. I saw all I wanted to see. I told the doctor that we would like to leave. Ibatu saw that I was upset and touched my hand. Instantly, I felt concern. We traveled outside this building, oh. a building that I did not wish to see again. I saw the dark side of this civilization. The Ebens are not the humane civilization we thought they were. Um, do you want to continue with the with the rest of this, or do we want to stop it here? I think we should stop it here, but I thought that was interesting that the female Eben touched his hand and concern. Um, maybe there's a little little crush going on there. Who knows? Right. Uh -huh, maybe. It's like, wink, yeah. wink. Little, 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 and, uh, inter, little intergalactic jungle fever. Is that what they call it? They are not hey, good looking. They're like, me. we see how y'all do it here, but let me show you how we do it on Earth. <laughs> Check out this, check out this man meat right here. Oh, no, not the oh, man meat. 